Well, welcome once again to Voice of Reason Radio. Your host, Chris Honholtz and Richard Story, joining you on this January 21st, 2022. Uh, yeah, that's 2020-T-O-O, 2022. Oh boy, here we go again. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> we are into a brand new year. Uh, this is our second recorded program for the year. Uh, so grateful to be back with you guys yet again. Uh, it was really nice to hear from some of you guys that uh, were, you know, um, enjoyed the last program and uh, really had some nice comments for us. Thank you so much for that. Really grateful and uh, grateful to be able to do this, hopefully continuously through this year. We'll see how that goes because we have no idea what this this year has in store for us. Um, I, I Rich, I will say that this particular year is shaping up to be very strange. I never thought I'd see Starbucks be more conservative than Carhart or Car Carhart uh, when uh, they're the it's Starbucks that says, "Ah, oh, never mind. We're not going to make everybody that worked for us get vaccinated." But Carhart said, "I don't care what the Supreme Court said. You're still getting jabbed or you're getting fired." Um, very interesting. And now uh, you have countries in Europe uh, basically dropping all their COVID mandates, and uh, our mentally bereft. Uh, <laughs> president is doubling down so <laughs> this is the year where the world is topsy-turvy and uh black is white and uh good is evil and uh you know the the the, uh, the do dogs and cats will be dancing through the streets and uh mice will have nothing to worry about so it's it's going to be a very insane year because we've already started off on a very strange foot so we're grateful to be back with you guys uh you know just love being uh, to able to spend time with you now we want to remind you that we are part of the christian podcast community as we often say we really encourage you to go check out the various podcasts that are on there and uh, you're always going to find something worth listening to. You're always going to be blessed by it. In fact, I only got to listen to part of it. Sorry, Andrew. Had to go uh, when I got home. I actually had to be with my family. But uh, Andrew's program, uh, Apologetics Live, which they did on Thursday, uh, they actually you can either you can listen to the program via the Christian Podcast Community on the podcast, or you can go to YouTube where the uh, where the video is. But they actually had a uh, guy who's basically a secular podcaster uh, that had connected up with Andrew in a, in a different way. And they they have been on each other's podcast. And Andrew did a great job, both he and, and Justin Pierce, walking through, um, you know, ev ev essentially ev evangelizing and, and using apologetics with this particular secular podcaster. And it was a really good conversation. It was nice to hear somebody who didn't believe in God not trying to demean or, or or be nasty or talk down to people he was he was very polite and very respectful um but also being a bit goofy too so but that, you know, that's one of the things that you can you can go listen to so go check that out would also recommend please check out our uh our actual website which is slave to the king.com i can't believe i nearly forgot to say website i couldn't think of the word um <laughs> not off to a good start i folks we had gremlins attacking the computers when we got started poor rich had a they basically had a drum beat i i, I think the orcs were were coming up the uh, the cavern and were coming after rich through the uh, the headset because he was hearing a drum beat and nobody was playing the drums so um, they, they were coming from coming through the halls uh but that that's how this started and so we're just off to a weird start um and so we go to slave to the king.com in fact we put it on i think we put it out last week what i want you uh, and i'll put it in today's show notes i want you to check out rich's uh, article that he posted it's going to look a little weird because rich was having trouble getting on the site so the title is developing a daily prayer plan by richard story but then my my name's beneath it because I had to post it. So if you try to look for it, it might look a little weird. But it's on there, and but I recommend you check it out. He's got a really nice long long daily prayer plan that I think would be really helpful. Yeah, because we talk about reading plans, we talk about uh, you know disciplining our time for a variety of things. But I, Rich, I think this is a great idea. What about disciplining our time for? A prayer for, for, for excuse me a prayer plan and i think that was a great idea and, and so that's on there we'll put it on the show notes but we encourage you to not only read it and participate in it but we'd also recommend you uh share that with other people because i don't think that's something we develop it's great to see reading plans i mean g3 has got this great bible reading plan and here's a bunch of books that you can read and everybody's getting on board with that hey get this prayer plan out there let's do that as well um 
Also, uh, don't forget that there's a couple of ways that you can help support this program, one of which is to go to doctrineandlife.co. It's also on the website. That's where you can find the uh, the shirts that we have for this podcast. Um, really need to talk to those guys because, I mean, they came out with new shirts for different podcasts. Uh, Iron Sharpens Iron is on there if you if you guys listen to that. They're now selling they have some product there. Uh, so, but Doctrine Life has some great stuff. Uh, the guys at Well What are doing it. Um uh, the uh, you know uh, James White's got his on there. Iron sharpens iron. You got us. Definitely want you to go check that out. But that's one way you can do it. Uh, but we really need to talk to him because Rich, when if we're going to update our shirts, we need your uh, your standard weekly line, which you're going to give us in a minute. Because um, I think that's that would be perfect on a shirt. We really need to get them to do that. Um, and so that's one way you can do it. The other is our Patreon page. We actually have, uh, some, uh, some folks who are somebody who is actually, uh, helping us out with that right now. Who's actually been contributing. We're great, very grateful. If that's, that's yet another way that you guys can help. Uh, so if you're looking for a way to help the show and, and it seems some of you want to, those are ways that you can do that. And of course, you know, the biggest way you can always help is just by praying for us. Cause, our families have to put up with us, and then they, then they let us do the show. So if you want to pray for us and pray for our families, that would be the most fantastic way to support us. And, of course, listening and sharing the podcast uh, as much as you can. Uh, I know a lot of you guys listen, and it's easy. I can tell how many of you actually have your podcast app set to automatic download because I know that many of you aren't d- downloading within 30 minutes of me uh, posting this and I see this huge number pop up, <laughs> which, which usually you to, when we started would take us at least a week, maybe uh, two weeks to get even that number. You guys, a bunch of you have it on automatic and then you just download it and listen to it later. Don't forget to hit the share button, put that out there because that's another way that you can support the program just by letting know, people know the program exists. So those, those are some ways that you can help the program. And of course, we want to hear from you. We said this last week. We want to hear from you because one of our goals, it won't be the only thing we do this year, but one of our goals, hopefully with this program this year, is to try to make this a bit more personal in the sense that we talk about theological precepts. We talk about how it applies to maybe modern day events that are going on around us. We talk about things that are happening to the church and how to view that. But what about you as an individual? And that's what tonight's program is going to be. We're kind of an extension from last week. What, how to personally apply and understand something from a biblical perspective. And so we want to do more of that this year, uh, not just hit the hot button topics. There may be times that we have to do that, but we want to speak to you, our listeners. So we would love to hear from you. And you can do that by going to slave to the king.com and hitting the contact us link, or you can email us at voice of reason radio at gmail.com. Either way, please hit us up. We'd love to, to hear from you guys in that regard. So I think I covered everything rich. And I think I actually shaved it down a couple of minutes. Does that sound right? Did I get everything? <laughs> I think so, brother. I think I'm getting a little little faster covering all those uh, initial points. If I don't do it right up front, I'm going to forget. And if you get it to the end, you guys are just going to cut it off. So I want to get it out of the way quick. <laughs> so with that said, I'm going to ask my brother what I always ask. And y'all, get, y'all know what he's going to say. And it's fantastic. I love what he, uh, what he says. Rich, how you doing this week, brother? Better than I deserve, brother. Amen, amen. <laughs> is that what that is? That, that is what you got. You, if you said anything else, I would have stopped the program and asked if you're all right. Okay, because if you don't say <laughs> that, I know you're being held hostage. Okay, so. <laughs> Well, I, I was tempted there for a moment to try to come up with something different. But. <laughs> if you ever and, answered anything else but that, I would stop the show and, and call whatever police department is down there and have them send SWAT because something would be wrong. <laughs> well, I, I did not create that. I borrowed it from another brother who I'm sure borrowed it from someone else. And I've actually heard Vody use that phrase at times in a couple of different sermons by him, so I'm, I'm not real sure who originally came up with the phrase, but I know in my particular situation in my wheelchair, I've gotten more looks and questions by responding by with that than I could ever put into words because, you know, people <laughs> ask, well, how are you doing? And I say, well, better than I deserve, and they look at me just yep. kind of cross-eyed like, are you crazy? Yeah. I mean, you know, and I've been able to use that as a springboard or a transition to you know 
start a gospel conversation, but you were mentioning the daily prayer plan. I want to point out, too, though, that that is not exhaustive. That was designed just to give you a bare-bones basic idea of something that you could do and put into your own words with some topical suggestions from the Bible and Scripture to apply to your own life and to put into your own words. But another resource that I would encourage everyone to read is by J.C. Rowell, and it's called A Call to Prayer. If you're wanting to grow in your spiritual discipline of prayer, I could not suggest that little booklet more highly. And you can find it online to read for free, and, and it's a fairly short short article or book booklet, but it is it is beyond anything wonderful, and it definitely will make you stop and take pause and take assessment of how your prayer life is going. Um, and I know in that article, I, I share that, you know, like most people, I only went to the Lord in prayer out of a reaction to mm-hmm. something that was going on instead of, you know, making it a, a daily practice and a daily habit. So, um, but I appreciate you mentioning that. And um, we have heard back from several people that found it beneficial. And, and to me, that was encouragement and a blessing in itself, just knowing that it was a few words of comfort to someone else. But brother, there's something that I do want to ask you. Okay. And I know you're going to kill me for this, Oh boy! but your birth, your birthday <laughs> is coming up next month. Why are you going to do this asked, to me? <laughs> and Well, you didn't ask for suggestions for ideas and ways to celebrate your birthday. No, I didn't. But I provided <laughs> I provided you an idea and you just totally watered it up, threw it out and rejected it. Okay. And I suggested you go skydiving. <laughs> I would do it in a heartbeat. I would love to try that at least one time. I have no desire. Let me let me let me let me let me make this super clear. I have absolutely without a doubt no desire of any kind in any way whatsoever to jump out of a perfectly good aircraft, okay? The aircraft is going to get me from point A to point B just fine without me jumping out, okay? I, I will happily sit in there, read my book, eat, you know, eat my peanuts and drink my soda and get to the landing on uh, with the airplane intact and I don't need to wear a backpack and, and jump out of the sky with goggles to make that happen. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm terrified of heights. I really am. And I don't like flying whatsoever. And I've been asked, why would I want to skydive when I'm scared of heights, I'm scared of flying, and basically scared of falling. And I was asked if I was scared of dying, and then I told them, no, I'm not scared no. of dying. I'm just scared of falling. <laughs> and that's actually one reason I would like to attempt skydiving is to experience it and to maybe kind of help overcome a fear that I know I have because over the years in various positions I had working in the real world, you know, or out in the world, you know, I've had to go through bucket truck training and I had to hang from scaffolds and, and 20 foot extension ladders and all this kind of stuff. And never was really comfortable with any of it. And <laughs> even to this day, I'm not particularly, particularly fond of heights. But wheelchair and all, I'd skydive in a heartbeat if I could talk my wife into taking me. <laughs> Which I can guarantee you, I already know her answer, no. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not really scared of, I'm not scared of dying. I'm not really scared of pain. I'm just scared of falling. Yeah, I just, I, like I say, I, I have zero, I've never understood the concept of, this is fun, jumping out of an aircraft and plummeting to the earth at terminal velocity and then hoping that when you pull the line, the chute opens. <laughs> it just, it's never been an appeal to me. I just, I really don't, look, I die in this life. I know where I'm going to be. But in the meantime, I don't want my last view of, of this life, me of uh, be of me going, as I slam into the ground. So <laughs> I'm just not anxious to do that. So yeah, I, I will find something far more interesting, you know, like just staring more at, staring, st- yeah, I'll, I'll sit on the couch and stare at my toenails. That'll be far more interesting than diving out of an aircraft. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
before we bore people to tears. Um, we really well, should... I, I know, but actually, this I was working on my topic transition. So well, then, by all means, go for it. <laughs> you you refuse to jump out of an airplane with a parachute. This is true. And and I guess because you have a fear of dying that way, or just a complete lack of interest, but at the heart of it, is it the fact that you are trying to avoid suffering at all cost? Very good transition, sir. Very good transition. Uh, not so much suffering, because I don't think you'd really feel much when you hit the ground. You just hit the ground, and then you wake up uh, in one place or the other. I don't know <laughs> why you're falling 10,000 feet and knowing that that ground's coming up and not knowing for sure if that parachute's going to open. I think there'd be a little bit just, of suffering going on. A little bit of anxiety. To the Lord. <laughs> No, brother, that, that's actually a fantastic uh, point. It, 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 that, that is, I think there would be an intense amount of anxiety, and, 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 and that would cause some definite suffering on your system. Um, but that is, that's a great point, and that is the topic of our, our show tonight. Um, we kind of nodded at this last, last week. We were talking about the issue of uh, justification and sanctification, and one of the things that we learn in sanctification is that, you know, it, not only are we set apart as sanctified, but there's this process by which God is is making us more like Christ, conforming us to His image, and and revealing in us what He has already accomplished uh, through uh, through that setting us apart and making us holy, uh, which is not justification. Justification is us being made right and and you know and and appearing as righteous before God because we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us but rather the idea we are set apart and made holy for his use. So that process of sanctification where he is conforming us in, to the image of Christ and revealing what he has set us apart and made us to be, um, part of that process, Rich, is that we go through trials, tribulations, oppressions, persecutions, and suffering. And um, I talked about last week, and I, and I, I put that out there not for any kind of... Um, what can I say? Any kind of personal gratification of sharing my own stuff, but rather just to to point out, this is something that all of us uh, deal with in some way. That there were issues going on in in recent history in my life that made me, that challenged me in this area. That I felt what I felt was justified anger and frustration with a certain situation, along with many other situations. But this was kind of like that straw, proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And it was through my own pastor's counsel that I'm beginning to understand this topic a little bit better than I think I've ever understood it before. Um, I won't say that I've got this dialed in because I, I don't. <laughs> um, it, but what it's caused me to do is not only as I'm, as I'm reading Scripture and I'm seeing the things that God does, through these difficult situations, through these periods of suffering with his people, I'm also spending time uh, going through a couple of books, one of which is Rejoice and Tremble, which is, uh, I think it's by Michael Reeves. I think a really, really good book on understanding the right fear of God, uh, which has a lot to do with how we approach God and how we worship him and how we understand him and what that right fear causes in us. And I think it, uh, it really, to my own pastor's uh, point, helps you understand, first and foremost, how you view God, and then how you view God and how you are looking at Him and how you are looking at what He does then impacts your practice. And I think one of the big mistakes, and this is what I was doing and, and continue to struggle with, is... It's kind of like Peter stepping out on the water. Christ says, okay, Peter, you say you can come out of the boat? Come. I, I, I bid you come. And he is walking on the water. We are not told how far he walked. We don't know. Could have been one step. Could have been six. Could have been 15. We don't know. What we do know is he got, he got closer to Christ because when he sank, Christ pulls him out of the water. But what did he do? He took his eyes off of Christ and looked at the wind and the waves. And so it's that's, I think, probably the, one of the best examples I can think of 
of what we do when we face suffering. And that's certainly what I was doing and continue to do on, uh, off and on, on at, at various pl- times and places. Um, looking at Christ, we have a, you know, we have a right understanding and our emotions and our thoughts and our actions will follow that. Just as Peter's feet kept moving forward, so our thoughts and actions move in the right direction. When we take our eyes off Christ, that's when we run the the risk of sinking down into the muck and the mire and being depressed and angry and anxious and, and, and not rightly understanding who God is and what he's doing. And so I think this book does a good job helping you, and I'm, I'm about halfway through it, um, framing what the right fear of God is so that you have the right understanding of who he is and how we ought to worship him. I, I like what uh, Reeves does in this book. He does a, a comparison of what we think of fear as um, being afraid, like terrified, run away kind of thing. But there's this fear that he describes where we are in, it's this all-encompassing view of God where his righteousness and his holiness and his love and his mercy and his gracious and his kindness and his justice all weigh on us in such a way that we don't go ah and freak out and run away because we're afraid of only his wrath, but rather it is this all-encompassing fear where we love him and worship him so much that, it, as he says, it pitch, it kind of pitches us forward, with forward toward God, down on our knees, down on our face in worship. And I, it's because you have a right understanding of who he is. And I think that's one of the things that's really important in forming how we understand concepts like suffering and pain and trial and tribulation is, as my pastor is teaching me, rightly understanding who God is and what he's doing. And I think that's one thing. Another one that I'm going through, and it's I've never heard of this individual before. Uh, but I've actually shared it with my pastor as well. It is a book called Why Does It Have to Hurt? The Meaning of Christian Suffering by Dan McCartney. And what caught my attention is it had a, a, a recommendation by uh, Sinclair Ferguson. And usually if he's going to say something's pretty good, it's going to, you know, that's worth at least giving it some time. And uh, McCartney in this book, I think does a really good job from what I've heard so far. My problem is with audiobooks like this, I, I, keep, I tell people... I, I don't mind audiobooks. I'm trying to do them more. Um, I'm better with n- narrative, so it could be a, a history book, like a, you know, a, you know, basically a history book. It could be fiction. It, it could be. Um, I listen to uh, you know a secular book, um, Blackout by uh, Candace Owens, and it was they were more narrative enough that I, I could kind of pay attention. Books like this, which have theological premise and they build on themselves, for me it's a little bit more difficult. But I have been listening to it uh, bit by bit, and one of the things that I think he he one of the most recent chapters I listened to, he did a, a very interesting job of talking about how in our suffering we are connected with Christ because Christ suffered and and, and we suffer in Christ, and so there's this connection that happens or not happens but exists because we are suffering in Christ we are suffering with Christ and I think a lot of times when we say suffering in Christ rich one of the things we think about is like persecution because Christ suffered on the cross and I think that's probably the primary most direct way of understanding that but I also think you know when in this life Christ suffered in a variety of ways as well and I want to be cautious about this I don't want to get all squishy with it but Christ understands our temptations because he was tempted as we were, but yet without sin. Christ told you know his followers and stuff. He's like, look, you know, you say you want to follow me. Um, foxes have holes, birds have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. For example, Christ knew what it meant to be, you know, as an itinerant preacher on the you know, on the road, not have a place to to sleep, not have enough to eat. So suffering in that way. He understood mockery and humiliation because the people that had watched him grow up said, oh, how dare you talk to it this way and chased him out of town. So in so many ways, Christ understood not only the physical suffering of the crucifixion and the spiritual suffering of the wrath of God being poured out upon him, but he understood the day-to-day suffering as well. And we recognize in what he, the way he lived, 
he never once spoke against his father for these things. So when we suffer, and, and I've got a lot of verses that I can I can point to in this, and I don't think we'll go through everything, but we still suffer in Christ because we are in Christ and our suffering connects us to Christ. So it's a very interesting book. I would I would say at least give it a, a read or a listen. I think you'll learn some stuff from that. Certainly uh, the Rejoice and Tremble. Um, I think both of those are helping me frame a bit better my understanding that as, as I have been taught by my own pastor, as I said, my eyes have to be fixed on Christ in such a way that I'm looking at him, not at my circumstances, not to say I ignore my circumstances, but if I'm eyes, my eyes are fixed on him and my eyes are rightly understanding him and my, my mind and my worship is on him, then what happens to me now has better context. Does that make sense, Rich? Absolutely, brother. But before we go any further, I want to make the point as clear as I possibly can. A lot of us that are truly born-again Christians, we also have to realize that there's a difference between our suffering for Christ mm-hmm. and discipline by Christ. And that's that's something that far few of us really take time to examine with what we're going through in our life. And I might, I'm going to sort of kind of use you as an example. I'm not saying that Mm -hmm. the Lord is disciplining you. I'm just using it as an example with what you've gone through. Sure. You know, it could be a result of something of possible sin that's been in your life. And the Lord's using this to discipline Mm -hmm. you to conform more to his image, or he could be allowing you to go through some form of suffering or persecution in order to mold you more to his image. Mm -hmm. The end result is the same, but the onset of that trial or suffering may differ. And one thing that I would like to encourage our listeners to do is if you experience yourself going through one of those stormy times of life, and sometimes it's pretty obvious that, you know, okay, you know, a family member has passed away or I'm sick, or I'm going through this, this, or this, or a family member's got to have surgery, you know, and we're concerned about them, and worried about them, you know, that that's pretty obvious, okay, this is not a result of, of my sin, per se, and I'm not being disciplined, it, it's a trial, and it's a suffering meant to make us lean more on Christ, but when we're going through these trials, the the solution is the same, we go to the Lord in prayer, And if we're not sure of the cause, say if you were lying and cheating and and showing up late for work and not coming in and you got fired and you lose your job and your family's lost its means of income, you know, that would be a result of sin. And you need to go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to reveal that sin, ask you to grant you strength to overcome that temptation for that particular type of sin. You know, we need to go to the Lord in prayer and, and ask, is this a result of sin, what I'm going through? Help me to learn and to understand what you're wanting to teach me. Help me to lean on you more. Help me to understand my own sinful temptations because of the desires that are in my heart. Mm-hmm. You know, the Lord does not lead you into sin. The Lord will not lead you in to temptation, but we are tempted by what our heart desires. And the Lord will allow us to be tempted, but he will also provide a way out of that temptation. And sadly, far too many times without staying in in prayer to the Lord and walking with the Lord and reading our Bibles and doing what we're commanded by the Lord, we will fall into temptation at times And the result of that will make us go back to Christ on our knees in repentance and to learn. And, you know, sometimes things that people go through is a result of sin in their life. And the Lord is using what's going on to discipline them because he loves us. And that's something we, we never think about. How often have we ever thanked the Lord for the discipline he imposes on Mm -hmm. us because he does love us because we are truly his children yeah. versus, you know, allowing us to go through some form of suffering as a means of sanctification. And 
I, I'll probably speak on this a little bit more later on in this episode, but if we are suffering during the course of that suffering, if our hope is still completely laid on Christ, if Christ is the focus of our hope during that suffering, that is a true evidence that we are being sanctified for his glory, for his purpose, and for his use. Now, I know in our day and age, there are many, quote unquote, celebrity pastors. Some of them are celebrity, just like a celebrity in some television show or movie. But I'm talking about solid Bible-believing pastors that are faithfully proclaiming God's word week in and week out. Men like Paul Washer, John MacArthur, Bodie Bachman, so many others. We need to stop and think, for this man to be used by the Lord like he's being used, could you imagine how much suffering and how much mm-hmm. sanctification, how many trials that man has gone through in his life in order to be such a vessel to be used by the Lord? Amen. Look at look at the Apostle Paul, how much he went through, how much he was crushed, how much he suffered in order to be fully used by God in the way that he was, because God does not use powerful, rich, influential men. He takes busted, broken pot vessels and crushes them to powder and rebuilds them in the image of his son in order for him to be glorified, because Paul proclaimed, in my weakness, I am strong, because he, throughout everything he endured, in all of his weaknesses, he relied on nothing but the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll get it. We'll we'll touch back on this in a little bit, but in Philippians chapter one verse twenty one, Paul stated, "For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain." Yeah. And I'll let our listeners kind of mull over that for a moment as I go back to you, and I'd like to touch back on that verse later on. But go ahead, brother. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I think that's that's one of the things that I think is was a challenge for me in all of this. This this idea that we, I think we can know intellectually that God will use difficult circumstances to mold us and, and to shape us and to sanctify us. When you're in the midst of it is when things can be very difficult. And I think that's where it is so very important for us to remember how we view God is how we are going to view what he, the tool that he is using. And so, and I, I appreciate the distinction um, as we're talking about suffering here in this uh, in this particular episode, we're talking about not those things that we have brought upon ourselves. Uh, you know, that is a sinful act, and God is either allowing the consequences of our sin to to play out so that we are disciplined, or or, or, or something to that effect. But rather, we are talking about the suffering that comes in the course of this life. Either it can be those things of uh, of uh, work related or health related it can be some uh, difficulty that we are encountering in our life it could be some uh, terrible loss that we've uh, gone through it can be someone who has done something very uh, uh, sinful or evil to us and so we go through these periods and we're, we're dealing with these and I've, uh, we're gonna try to kind of focus the f- fact that the Bible does not speak to us as suffering is something that we should go, oh my, how did this happen? But rather recognizing it is something God is using in us to, to sanctify us, to form us, to conform us to Christ, but also that it ties us to Christ and, and, and shows that we are in Christ as well. And I just want to point something out. This is something my pastor shared with me, and I'm very grateful for it, is It goes back to that idea of having my mind fixed rightly on God and who he is. And one of the things he pointed out to me was in in Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. The the first half of this psalm, or actually like two-thirds of this psalm, is Asaph speaking to God about the prosperity of the wicked, how terrible it is, and what they do, and how they're wicked they are, and how... They just seem to get away with it. And it's almost as if, you know, it's, it's like he's saying, it's almost like, God, do you, do you even know what's going on? And so I think sometimes we can have that that mindset, whether it's when somebody, as uh, it was written here, uh, you see this evil and, and nobody's getting you know being held accountable. And Lord, why is this not happen- or being dealt with? But 
also in our sufferings. We can see these things happening and this isn't right. Why is this being allowed? But the the psalmist writes in this, he says, you know, he says, writing to God, even though he said all these things, then he says to God, when my soul was embittered, in other words, looking at all this, to, you know, and this is verse 21, looking at everything that's happening, I was embittered by it. Looking at all this evil that they're, that's getting away with them. He says, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. So he's writing to God saying, I was brutish. I was ignorant. I was like a beast toward you, God. And, you know, I was saying about all these terrible things about what's going on. And yet I was acting like a beast, not toward the wicked, but toward you, Lord. And then he goes forward and says in verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven, but you. And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He rightly fixes his eyes on Christ, he, or on the Lord. He rightly recognizes God, and he speaks of this, how God will judge the wicked, that they will perish. But it is um, those that, that are in God, they, they are, you know, God is their refuge, and he will tell of all his works. He is, has the, with that mindset, recognizing who God is, that there's nothing on earth he desires but God. Now think about that. He's just spent, you know, nearly 20 verses talking about how terrible these evil people are in the world. But then he says, there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. So clearly there was a point at which he wanted someone or wanted God to, to do something about these terrible, wicked, wicked people. He wanted something other. But then he says, there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. And I think, Rich, that is one of those things we have to have that mindset. That our greatest and most powerful desire should be for God to be with him, to be right in his eyes, to serve him. Because if we do that, if that's our mindset, then like, like the psalmist here, we then rightly you know can view what's going on instead of being angry about what's going on with the you know these evil wicked people he can simply say you know for behold those who are far from you shall perish you put to an end everyone who is unfaithful to you now he has a right understanding of god now he rem remembers who god is and how he will deal with this in other words it doesn't matter what they do in this life it doesn't matter what they get away with in this life these wicked and evil people they will be held accountable so what does he desire does he care about it that you know this needs to be dealt with now no there's nothing more than i desire than you and therefore i'm going to worship you and therefore i will trust that you will deal with these evil people so i think that's a good place that was one of those things that helped me remember how i view god and how i view suffering it has to be filtered through my understanding of him and I think if we, it, Rich, if we understand that God is, you know, he is not ignorant of what is going on. He is rather, he, he has decreed all that will happen. He is sovereign over all things. You know, the, the scriptures tell us that we may plan our paths, but it is God who may, you know, uh, you know, we plan, we may make our plans, but it's God that guides our steps. He, we don't get from point A to point B without him. Okay, he's in utter, complete control. And so therefore, even the wicked will do uh, what God has decreed for them to do. And they will be held accountable for what they do. So when we encounter suffering with the recognition that God is in complete control, then we recognize that suffering is something that God has decreed. And it's really, that's one of those things we, you know, you so many, especially the seeker-friendly type churches or people who try to kind of be God's defender, so to speak. Well, no, no, no. God doesn't, didn't make that bad thing happen. God weeps with you. Rather, scripture makes it clear so we, we should not only expect suffering, but we can actually rejoice in suffering. I kid you not. This is what scripture tells us. Go to, uh, you open your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, let's stop right there. What is Paul doing? He has fixed us 
not on the suffering, but fixed us on a reality, which is we are justified by God, by, uh, by faith in Christ, okay? This is a fixture that we need to have our mind on. We cannot go to the suffering first. We go to the fixture that we are justified by faith and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what Paul wants us to start with, fixing your mind on your salvation in Jesus Christ. We have peace with him. No matter what happens in this life, no matter what we encounter, whether it's good, bad, somewhere in the middle, it do, none of that changes if you are in Christ. You have peace with God. That is the starting place. Verse 2, though, or excuse me, through him, we have also obtained faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So our rejoicing is in this, right? We, we, we fix our mind on our salvation. We fix our mind on, the, on the, uh, the, the unwavering truth that Christ has redeemed us. We rejoice in that. But then he says in verse 3 something that seems so completely different. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Wait. God has saved me. I'm going to have eternity with Christ. There's, here's this wonderful promise. So how on earth can I rejoice when I'm suffering? And he goes on to say, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endu endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We rejoice in our sufferings because God is using our sufferings to create this kind of chain of events, almost. It, it, it's not necessarily a you know, step-by-step -step chain, but you get the point. In other words, sufferings start a process of change in us, where we, it, which produces hope and character. Uh, excuse me, it produces endurance and character and hope. All because we went through sufferings. We were able to rejoice because God is doing something in these sufferings, okay? And I can say that with confidence because Scripture also tells us that um, we go into 1 Peter chapter 1. Here we go, verse 6. It is you who, uh, it, 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 in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. trials. So again, he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's talked about this imperishable, undefiled, and uh, unfading inheritance. And he says we, uh, that's being guarded. So it is in this. It's that salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last days. It is in this that we rejoice. But like, just like Paul, he says, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So where have we started? With our fixation on what the sheer promise of Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 7, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in, the, in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So our testings, our sufferings, are those trials just like the the gold that goes through the furnace to burn off the impurities? You know, and gold will eventually perish. It's it's going to go away. This is even this is even a greater testing. Something that is sure. Something that will never fail. Something that will never will never lose. That testedness. You know that or that testing. That you know that uh, purging through the fire, so to speak, is what he is doing. So when we go back and we Paul says. Sufferings produce endurance, boom, boom, boom. We see that what, it, as Peter says, it is God, test, you know, it is that faith that is put through the test, just like gold through the fire. He is using sufferings, you know, for the purification of you and so that your faith is revealed to be true. And, and I know this one more thing because in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says to the Philippians, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So there's this lifelong process, Rich, where suffering has a purpose because it actually puts us through the fire and it produces something in us, which, you know, as, as Paul said, endurance, character, and hope. And as he says to the Philippians, this is a work that God will be doing throughout our lives and he will complete it on the, revel on the day that Christ returns. So we know that it is God's, this is going to blow your minds when you hear this, that your suffering is God's good gift 
to produce in you something that he is turning you into or revealing of which you are. And it's going to, you, when, and on the day of Christ's return, you're going to see all that he did and all the work he accomplished, even when you were going through the worst of suffering. Is that mind blowing, Rich? Uh, it is. And it's, there's also a flip side to what you said in that we're being purified. We're being made like pure gold. We're being molded into the image of Christ. But at the same time, any remnant of darkness within us is being purged. Mm -hmm. Our love for the world is being burned up. It's being melted away. It's being stripped away. It's making us become more and more and more dependent on Christ, growing us in humility, growing us in knowledge and understanding of our own sin and our own standing before God without Christ. It's making us rely purely on Christ and his finished work is purging us of all of our pride, of our worldly opinions, of our worldly philosophies, of any remnant of the culture left within us. And as long as we're still on this earth, there still will be remnants here and there of all of those things. So while we're walking and visiting this earth, we are being made over into his image day by day. We're dying to death day by day. We're being purified. We're being made more and more and more into the image of Christ. And he does not do this out of some sadistic type of, I'm going to make you suffer, popping the whip. He does it because he loves us, because we are to be as much like Christ as the faith and grace he grants us allows us to be. Ultimately, we are, as we talk about progressive sanctification, what is it we're being molded to do? What is it we're molded to be? We're given over to proclaim him, his word, his glory, his righteousness. We're being molded to made to be made in the image that everything is dis that is discussed in First John is talking about. Being purged from evil, being purged from sin, to grow in our love for Christ, to grow in our love and desire to obey Christ to grow in the desire to pursue holiness and sanctification. You know, there's, there are millions of untold professing Christians in this world that claim to know Christ, but have no desire to be like Christ. And that's sad. And we see that in today's world, probably more so than any other time of, in history. The number of people that proclaim to be a Christian, but live like the world and will honestly tell you that, well, the Christians around me live no different. I, I don't see anything different in them than I see in myself, and that's the problem. Yeah. When we look at those around us, and when I say around us, I'm talking fellow believers, fellow professors of Christ. When we look at them, we should see something different in them than we see in the world. We should see acts and words and behavior that is different in that professing Christian versus someone that is an atheist or someone that's in the world. Sadly, you look across the landscape of American evangelicalism, and most of what you see is worldly ideologies, cultural ideologies, societal ideologies, and they're trying to live with one foot in Christ and another foot in the world. And in 1 John, he explicitly states that is impossible. You are either in light or you're in darkness. Suffering has biblical and God-honoring purposes. We may not ever understand all the reasons for something that we go through here, but we will know when we're glorified perfectly standing with Christ in heaven. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that when we're talking about suffering— is that we we see it as this this horrible <clears throat> negative, and I understand why it's not pleasant. You know, suffering isn't something that as as we go through life we think, oh, I really need to suffer today. You know, we're not planning for that. We don't. We're not desiring it. But suffering is something our our Savior went through, and He told us that you know. <laughs> That, that, that no servant 
is greater than his master. So the idea that we could go through life without suffering is something that is foreign to what Scripture says. And it's interesting when we look at how the world views things, and I know others have said this as well, the world kind of looks at, at life as the best and most wonderful state is that you are always happy and you've never had bad feelings or negative emotions. And so it, we see today that the way the world approaches suffering is if you're suffering, it's either something outside of you, so therefore we have to legislate or uh, you know, or do some sort of societal change to cr- prevent that from happening. It's mental slash medical, so therefore it must be something going on internal and we can we can medicate or do something medical to change it. Or it's some sort of uh, outside event that we need to to uh, change the world to, to 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 fit us so that we don't feel a negative response. Um, I, I give you an example that's a bit controversial. It, you know, Matt, Matt Walsh, a popular conservative blogger, uh, had talked about. I guess he's written a book that kind of. It's a children's book that basically points out the ludicrousy, uh, the ludicrousness of the transgender movement, and it's made it's made a lot of press. And there are people who are of of that would identify themselves as transgender, gender, are saying they're having nightmares now because of him and things that he said. They're they're feeling suicidal, etc. And so the world says there must be something wrong with Matt Walsh because these individuals should not ever have to feel a negative emotion. The best place for them to be is perfectly at peace with themselves and the decisions that they've made. So therefore, we have to change something so that they themselves don't feel this. Yet scripture does not say, and and I understand we're talking about sinful issues, but I just want to use that as an example as how the world views a negative and something that's a negative, something that's considered suffering, something that's considered, uh, a, you know, a, t- a terrible experience. Yet Scripture doesn't speak for the cry for the Christian of suffering in that way. Uh, Romans eight sixteen says, "The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ." Provided we what suffer with him, in order that we may be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is be to be revealed in us. Suffering is actually something that identifies us as with Christ. That is, it is something that if if we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, we are going to be suffering with him. Suffering is something we have to expect. Again, I'm not saying we go out and look for some way to suffer, but rather we don't find it to be a foreign thing and we don't look at it as a a terrible, horrible, negative thing in the sense that it should never happen and therefore something needs to be changed to change this. Rather, it is something that connects us to Christ and identifies us with Christ and when we have that right understanding of who God is and what he's doing with suffering, as Rich and I were just talking about, this this changing, this sanctification, this purification that we go through, that we recognize the sufferings that we go through now aren't even comparable to the glory that's going to be revealed. In other words, we recognize it as that, that tool that God is using to conform us and identify us and tie us to Christ, and we give him glory for that. This is the thing that was foreign to me when when my pastor said, you got to get to a place where you're actually thanking God for this. You're actually thanking him for this issue and for this person and for this circumstance. And I'm like, how on earth do you do that? How can you possibly pray to God and say, thank you, for this evil person, for example, how, how do you do that? And I think it goes back to rightly understanding what God is using in that context. We tend to look at it as though it is this terrible foreign thing, but yet scripture tells us otherwise. It actually says that we are connected to it. And I think that's why we can go to uh, passages like uh, Romans 8.28, which, uh, which tells us, and we now... And we know that for those who love God and all, or excuse me, for those who love God, so those in Christ, 
all things work together for good. All things, this includes our suffering, together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And then, you know, we have that, that golden chain of redemption. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of, of his son in order that he might be the first born among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. We know that all things, all things are working together for good. And it's uh, for his purposes. It is for his glory. And yet he's using that to conform us to the image of Christ. And that's why he can say in, you know, in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not graciously give us all things? Who can, who shall bring a charge against God elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus, though is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Um, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Wait a second. Those are all sufferings, right? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. And he goes on to verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Nothing separates us, right? We will, Nothing will, uh, will be able to separate us, separate us, excuse me, I'm getting too fast again, <laughs> from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So suffering conforms us, suffering identifies us, suffering uh, you know purifies us and 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 uh, connects us to Christ. And then what can we say? That none of that, none of that separates us from the love of God. And I think Rich, the only way we do that is we start with that first place as we saw in in Psalm 73, we have to rightly understand who God is and desire him above all things. Then suddenly suffering is not this foreign, horrible thing. It is what God is using in our lives, and he has chosen this time and place for us to go through. Does that, does that work? Oh, absolutely, brother. And like you said, no one in their right mind would pray for suffering. None of us sit around, oh, Lord, please grant me to suffer today. Um, I, I think um, some brothers and sisters in some parts of this world experience that every day with real persecution, having to flee for their lives just because they're reading the Bible. But all, th those of us here in America, you know, we're, we're used to having things easy and given to us. And, you know, like you were saying that the idea of suffering is supposed to be something to be shunned instead of embraced and be joyful in. Um, you know, and like I said, we, we, we don't want suffering. We don't say, Lord, please bring me some more suffering. But as Christians, we need to rightly understand that in suffering, the Lord has a purpose for us in that. Thomas Watson wrote, affliction often teaches us more than a sermon, meaning that how many of us would truly grow in righteousness and grow in grace and grow grow in understanding if everything was just easy breezy every day. I, I, what I'm going to say is very simplistic, and people have put it in far better ways than I have, but a flower does not grow or bloom by just sunshine. It has to have rain. It has to have the storms. It has to have the lightning hitting the ground and recharging the nitrogen that's in the soil and fertilizer in order for it to grow and bloom. And if it was not for suffering, could we truly rejoice in those easy days? But as we mature in Christ, we learn to rejoice even more in the trying days. Um, and I'm sure some of our listeners are familiar with Pastor Don Curran. He's part of Heart Cry Ministries with Paul Washer. He posted this the other day, and I've saved it for this episode because I thought it was pretty good. And it's titled, The Best Theologians. Seminaries teach knowledge. The school of affliction instills wisdom. The church has always advanced more swiftly when God, when God deems it necessary to hurt men and women. Martin Luther reached the same conclusion. He testified, Trials teach you not only to know and understand, but also to experience how right, 
how true, how sweet, how lovely, how mighty, how comforting God's Word is. It is wisdom supreme. As soon as God's Word becomes known through you, the devil will afflict you and will teach you by his temptations to seek and to love God's Word. I think I read that wrong. But for I myself owe my Peptis many thanks for so beating, pressing, and frightening me through the devil's ragings that they have turned me into a fairly good theologian, driving me to a goal I should never have reached. What Martin Luther was saying is what I said earlier, that he would not have grown as a pastor, as a theologian, as a man of God, if it had not been for the trials and sufferings that God allowed him to go through. And that is still that still holds true for all of us in this day. Um, I know we're running short on time. What I was going to say about that segment from Philippians chapter 1, I would suggest that you go read some of the commentaries written on that passage by, say, John MacArthur or Matthew Henry. They are really, really enlightening, and what Paul truly meant in that passage. But um, I'll turn it back over to you, brother. There was a couple of other things I wanted to address, and I'll just wait and see how much time we got left <laughs> before I hit on those, because I know we're running a little bit long tonight. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's just one of those things that we, when we begin to recognize that, as you were saying with, with, with Luther, that the things that God puts us through are his intentional, specific plans and purposes, we begin to recognize that we then, when, even when we're going through, through suffering, through tribulation and trials, that this is God's good gift. And I know that sounds completely foreign if you're the person who is hooked up to an IV drip for the eighth time as you're going through chemotherapy and you have so much more yet to go ahead of you. And, and you think, how can this, how can this glorify God? But if in that suffering that you're enduring... God is stripping away, as you said, Rich, earlier, all those connections to this world. And you see God as this good and glorious and kind God and, and who will bring into your life that which he needs to bring in order to make you like your Savior, in order to conform you to his image so that you are fit for his use then you begin to realize that even in that, even in that difficult circumstance, that, that painful circumstance, that God is using this and you are a picture of his grace as you go through it. Well, Chris, what about that, the person that's raped, beaten, and tortured, and uh, you know, and this, this person that did the, the horrible thing, they were a professing Christian, and yet God allowed that to happen. I mean, how can a good, loving God allow that? There are people today who have gone through those terrible, terrible experiences, and yet they are some of the most powerful comforters for someone who, who is now facing it. We, we are actually called to comfort those in the way that we have been comforted. Okay? So scripture tells us that we actually, you know, um, we actually comfort those in the way that we have been comforted. So as we are going through affliction and God is working in our lives, we then comfort those others. So suffering who for that person who went through that this great evil. Well, how can you expect them to pray thank you God for being raped and tortured? It is that we pray to God for his good work in our life and that he is conforming us to Christ. And that even the person who endures a great evil recognizes that that evil man will be held accountable on the day of judgment 
and his profession of faith. Let's let's just take the most the, the most heinous situation you can imagine. He's a you know he's a professing Christian. Maybe people in the church think he's this great guy. Guess what? On the day of judgment, there is no place for that person to hide, and God will be glorified. Because that evil person is judged. So even in knowing that God's good work and his justice will never be escaped, like Psalm 73, we, you know, we can say, God, all I desire is you. So I understand when we say, well, God's suffering is, is a good thing and therefore we should, we should embrace it, we should love it. And you say, how dare you say such a thing? How dare you comp uh, uh, compare that evil to the, gore, the, the goodness of God? Because God is using that, that evil work, and he uses it sinlessly to conform us to the image of Christ. And we then can take the comfort with which we were comforted and comfort others. And guess what? Maybe you didn't get the comfort from the people that should have given it to you, but who does comfort you? Christ. Through his word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can gain comfort there. And you can then comfort for people in the word in the same way. And that is, I know that seems so foreign. I know that seems just absolutely grating on our nerves to think that God would allow that. But, he, you know, it is in Philippians 1, uh, 129 where he says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, not only should you believe in him, but you also suffer for his sake. I know he's talking about, because uh, he says in verse 30, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. He's saying, you know, he's referring to like persecution, but he's saying it has been granted to you that you would suffer for the sake of Christ. And when we suffer with our eyes fixed on Christ, with our eyes and our knowledge and our heart so enraptured with him, that the world around us goes, how can you endure this? How can you praise God for this? Now we can say something even greater. That it is not because this suffering was painful that I praised God. It was not that I had joy when this great evil was done to me. It is that I have great joy in my Savior who even now has appointed this time for me to go through for his sake. And it ties us to him. When you think about Christ in the garden, and he's, you know, and granted, his suffering was that he was to suffer for the sins of many. He was to, you know, to to take the wrath of God for the sins of many. But what does he say? He comes before God and he says, if you know, if there were any other way, may this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Knowing the suffering he's about to go through, knowing what he's about to endure, he prays to his Father, not my will, but yours be done. When we can look and say, this is not the plans that I had for my life. This is not what I wanted to have happen to my children. This is not what I, you know, what I wanted my job to do to me. This is not the evil that I wanted to endure. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. We recognize our sovereign Lord and Savior is working on us and changing us. And I don't expect that people are going to listen to this and be one to this in like... Hey, you listen to it for an hour podcast. You've got all this figured out. I just said, I'm, tr I'm still working through this myself. But it was Paul who wrote, in, in, again in Philippians chapter 3, ver, uh, verse 10. He says, or let me back up and go to um, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. So in other words, everything in this world. Everything that he could have, it's it's rubbish. He wants nothing to do. It's all loss. Because knowing Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, he says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. It's Get rid of it. It's not nothing I have is, is worth anything. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteous of, righteousness of my own that comes from him, or excuse me, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. Everything else, there's nothing that comes close. It's all rubbish. It's all loss. It's all worthless. The surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ and his righteousness. 
and, and for why? Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. In other words, dying to himself, dying to the world, dying to all of this so that he may be like Christ, that he would suffer all things and to be like Christ, that by any means possible that I may attain resurrection from the dead, that he is willing to throw it all away, endure all that he must endure so that he may be with Christ. That goes back to the first premise that we have to be Eyes solely fixed on the Lord, so much so that we recognize the work in his life, in our lives, from him is good at all levels, even as we endure suffering. And then we can be in Christ, suffer with Christ, be connected to Christ, and we can rejoice. And even when it's that difficult situation, be able to smile through it, to have joy through it, and to praise God for it. Rich, that's got to be hard for most Christians, especially in our day and age, to understand. Yet, I think it's the biblical response. Are we right? Absolutely, brother. Sadly, far too many of us pray to the Lord to take this cup from me, but are not willing to submit and say, but not my will, but your will be done. And as we grow in Christ, as we grow in understanding, the second part of that verse will have more meaning to us. But I want to provide our listeners with something as we close out this episode. If you're struggling with suffering, if you're struggle, struggle, I'm sorry, I cannot talk. If you're struggling with persecution, trials, or sanctification, or you're struggling in any way whatsoever, there's a book that I could not encourage our listeners to read more highly. And it is the book Holiness mm. by J.C. Ryle. And it's available for free online. You can, you can find it at several different websites. And you may stop and think, how in the world would a book written by J.C. Ryle almost 150 years ago about holiness, what does that have to do with how I deal with suffering? Read the book and then come back and tell me if it does not help open your eyes to the perspective and the understanding of what it means to struggle as a Christian or to suffer as a Christian. I'm just going to kind of close on those notes. On, on that w- note, I'm sorry, my <laughs> brain and my tongue have decided that they're going to take a vacation from each other at the close of this episode. <laughs> but <laughs> in closing, I'll say like I do each week, whatever you do this week, make it a point to proclaim the way of salvation at least once a day. Amen. Amen. I want to leave you with one last verse. Uh, James writing in uh, chapter 5, verse 10. He says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those who blessed, uh, those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, you have seen, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassion, compassionate and merciful. Look to the scriptures and see the work of God in his saints, the prophets of old. Look at the apostles, the writers of the New Testament, the patriarchs, all of it. There is not a person in scripture who did not suffer in some way. You can look to what God did for those who endured suffering and did so recognizing God's hand in it. Think about the apostles who rejoiced and uh, for being counted worthy to endure persecution for the name of Christ. How could they do that? How could you how when you're being beaten with sticks, when you're being threatened with imprisonment, where you're being you're prepared to be stoned, can you praise God? How can you do that? Because you look to the Lord and the work that He is accomplishing, what He has done through Christ, and what the promise of His coming and the promise of eternal life has for you. That's how they did it. How how is it that you could have people being burned at the stake for simply putting 
the Bible in the language of the people. How could they praise God and sing his hymns as the flames rose higher for that purpose? That they were going to be with Christ their Savior. And the Holy Spirit indwelt in them, empowered them, and strengthened them through that. But these were people of the book. These were people of Christ who looked to their, uh, the author and finisher of their faith. If we look to the trials and tribulations and then try to justify how we feel as we go through them and then look up at God and say, okay, help. That's kind of the Peter looking at the wind and the waves and sinking and going, Lord, save me. It's the wrong focus. Peter walked on the water and through the wind and the waves, he got soaked, he got wet, he got cold. And, you know, and yet he fixed his eyes on Christ and he was moving forward. When he took his eyes off Christ and he looked to the circumstances, looked to the waves, looked to the possibility of his, of, of his certain doom. That is when he took his eyes off of Christ and looked at the circumstances, looked at the potential suffering that he was about to go through. And that is when he sank and, and the Lord had, he had to call out to the Lord for rescue. We will endure trials and tribulations. They will be painful. They will be unpleasant. They will hurt. They will, you know, they will crush us. Sometimes in ways we never would wish on our worst enemy. Yet, we are called to endure that suffering. Now, remind you, now in that same book of James, he says, Is anyone suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, uh, cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let, the elder, uh, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. If you are suffering, you're called to pray. Bring your petitions before the Lord. You can call upon the elders. Sickness is a form of suffering. You can call upon the elders and have them pray for you. Call upon your brethren to come alongside you. We are not called to be solo Christians in a world of suffering. We come together. We pray together. We worship together. We, we pray over one another. We comfort one another. If you endure suffering, comfort others who are also suffering. You will be shocked. I... I I've shared some things that I am learning and yet still trying to put into practice. And I share this and people are like, thank you for sharing this. If I needed to hear this right now, I'm thinking, how can that be helpful to you? I haven't figured this out yet. <laughs> you know, we comfort one another in the ways that Christ and his Holy Spirit comfort us the way the word comforts us. And sometimes that means hearing hard truths. That means hearing the word of God preached to you that destroys the way you look at how you are suffering. And it hurt, that hurts too. <laughs> Believe me, I know. I'm very good at justifying my attitude at times. And yet when I, when I am confronted with the truth of God's word, when I, I am uh, you know, shown what God has said about a, a given circumstance, it's an affront to my pride, yet humbles me and brings me to my knees before the Lord. So sometimes comforting means confronting with the hard truth and we need to do that as well but you are not called to do this alone and you no one is telling you nothing about this podcast episode was about the fact that suffering is somehow you, you get to pretend it doesn't hurt pretend it's not bad no suffering hurts that's why it's called suffering scripture recognizes that but what we are called to is rather than focus solely on the idea that I shouldn't have to suffer, that I shouldn't be going through this, that what happened to me was wrong, we look to Christ and we say, you are our, are our Savior, your will be done. And whatever you have deemed appropriate in my life to conform me to your image, that is what I need to do. And I put my hands in, put myself in your hands and you rejoice because God is working in and through you. I know that's hard. That is a really hard thing for our in our minds to do. But that's why through all through God all things are possible. You go to his word, you go to your knees in prayer and you just dive into this and understand this. Prepare yourselves now. Maybe you're not going through suffering and you don't think that this is, applies to you. Start preparing because you're either in a trial, coming out of a trial or getting ready for a trial. There's, there's no point in this life that you're not going to face one. Get ready. Get 
to the Word of God and understand this. So, Rich, really appreciate the, the input on this. I, I, you know, this was not an easy one to do. I think for us, uh, I really, God may God work in me on my my time management skills, but because um, I really wanted to have a lot more to be able to say. But I'm I'm grateful that we were able to do this. Um, and so I, th- I appreciate your bro- uh, brother and the things that you brought on this, folks. Seek God, seek His uh, kingdom, seek Him first above all things. And as uh, as the you know psalmist wrote, may your desire be for Him be more than anything in this world. Thank you for being with us this week. God bless you guys. And as you go through this week, keep your eyes fixed on Christ. God bless you. We'll see you next time.